God's love is meteoric. His loyalty, astronomic. His purpose, titanic. His verdicts, oceanic. Yet in his largeness, nothing gets lost. Not a man, not a mouse slips through the crack. How exquisite your love, oh God. Sanctuary! Let's go! How many of you excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? How many of you are excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Praise Someone give us a praise. Jesus. He is holy. How many just lift your hands? Just welcome the Father. For he's worthy to be worshipped. song of ages to the Lamb. And all 
all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing in the song of ages to the last. Come on, y'all, help me sing this. Be your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your
to do whatever 
for everything that you've brought us through, God. Thank you for every valley, God, that we have gone through that has strengthened us to get to this point, Lord. We just say thank you, Lord. And even on the mountaintop, I pray that we don't stop saying thank you, God, for the things that you are doing and the things that you are gonna do, God. So just continue to strengthen us, Lord, in the way that you want us to go, God. Remove what needs to be removed, God, and we give you permission to come and fill us, Lord, in a new way, God. May we see you different today, Lord. May we hear you different today, God. Strength on strength on strength, Jesus.
thank you for my heart will sing forever oh, thank you for breaking the bread of your body spilling the wine of your blood thank you Yeah, come on, lift it up, church. Come on, you tell him from your heart. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that you did everything that needed to be done for me. Thank you. My heart will sing forever. I love how it says the cross was more than enough. And that's the promise that we stand on today. That when Jesus went to the cross and laid down his life and shed his blood, that it was more than enough. It was more than enough for whatever you have going on today. That blood, you know, it was God's, man, he was pouring out his adoration, his love for us, saying, I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to do whatever is necessary to bring you back to me, to bring you back to me. And so here in this moment, this is our opportunity to adore him and to say, God, you, you are so good for the way that you've loved me, for the way that you've seen me through, for the way that you forgave me. And honestly, if God never did anything for you ever again, the cross was enough for him to be worthy of all of our affection and love for the rest of our lives and for all of eternity because he spilled out his blood for the forgiveness that we needed, the freedom that we needed. And so we sing the cross is more than enough, you know, Man, that blood was what he was paying so that we could be whole, so we could come back to the Father. And so that blood, it is stronger than an addiction. That blood is stronger than a sickness. That blood is stronger than your greatest mistake. And that blood is stronger than anything that you feel ashamed about today. And that blood is stronger than your ego and your pride and all of your achievements too. Because it was only the blood that could bring us to the Father. So can we just adore him for a minute? Just in your own way, in your own words, would you just say, thank you, God. Thank you for what you did for me. Come on up in the mezzanine, on the side, come on in the back. Would you just tell him in your own way, God, thank you. Thank you for what you did for me. Thank you that it was more than enough. It was more than enough. And if you don't feel good enough for God this morning, the blood says a different word. It says a different story. It says that he did what was necessary so you could come to God. The blood was enough. Come on, you tell him, God, thank you. Lord, we adore you. We adore you. You're so worthy of our love, worthy of our affection, God, worthy of our praise and our awe and our wonder from now until eternity for what you've done for us, God. Yes, come on, you tell him. Oh, the cross, for you, God, it was more than.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, for your love. Thank you that you're with us, that you're here. Thank you that you're our freedom, our deliverer, our restorer. Thank you, God, that you're here right now and you're working in our minds and you're working in our hearts and you're putting us back together. And the roar of your love is silencing the fears in our minds. <laughs> Oh God, and the love that you pour out for us moment after moment after moment, it cleanses us and it washes us and it frees us and it heals us and it restores us, God. Thank you, Lord, for who you are and for what you're doing. We love you, God. We love you, God. I'd love to lead you in a prayer. If you feel comfortable lifting your hands, it's just our sign of reaching out to God. It's our sign of surrendering to God and I'd love to lead you in a prayer of just giving God permission to speak to you today. If you'd repeat after me, Jesus, I trust you. I give you permission to do what you need to do, to heal me, change me, correct me, and above all, show me more of who you are. I want you, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Yeah, come on, let's give it up for a good God this morning, church. Come on, let's give it up for a good God. Woo. Happy Palm Sunday. So glad that you came to church today. And, um, you know, God, he saw everything that you needed before you showed up today. And he came prepared. And so it doesn't matter um, what you feel or what you think walking in here today, he came prepared with whatever you need. And so I'm um, glad you're here, glad you're here. All right, turn to a few people, tell them they look great, that they smell great, that they are great. Go ahead and grab a seat. <laughs> Sanctuary, what's going on guys? How are we doing today? Uh, I'm, I'm not Taylor, I think that's kind of obvious. My name is Josh, uh, I'm here, I serve here on Sundays, and I serve here on Wednesdays at Rise. Where's my Rise community at? Come on. Um, I'm, they gave me some announcements to do, but I wanna shout out Rise first, because how can I not? Um, so if you are a college age student, or if you know someone who is college age, young adult, Wednesday nights here, 7 p.m., we gather, and we just commune, and we make God our priority. And we just know him more. And it's so beautiful. And um, it's, I can't even think of the words to say, but it's an awesome, it's a great community. And uh, so if you know someone, please, please, please invite them. We have an Instagram, Rise Sanctuary, something like that. It's on the Instagram. So shout out that. Um, 
Welcome, guys. It's Palm Sunday. Happy Palm Sunday. If it is your first Sunday or first time here, welcome. I think we have something for you at the welcome desk. Boom. Jesus is on that QR code somewhere. <laughs> um, scan that. That is just going to get you all signed up. We're, we want to know more about you. Just know who you are. So please, if this is your first time here, scan the QR code. Um, next, I think we have, oh, how could I forget? Guys, next Sunday. Easter, come on. So it's gonna be 9 a.m., 11 a.m. here. It's 10 10.30 at South. No 6 p.m. Sad about that. I love the 6 p.m., but it's okay. It's gonna be an amazing uh, time. This is a great opportunity to invite someone to uh, Easter, too. I invited all my friends. So invite your friends. Invite your mailman. I said that other time. Invite your mailman to Easter. Come on. Come on, invite your mailman. And we're also... Next week, we are gonna have baptisms. That was good, the timing's good. Not as good as Taylor, but I'm getting there. So if you're interested in getting baptized, that QR code will help you sign up and have more information about it. Yes, yes? boom. So if you're interested, or talk to someone about it. I'm sure anyone here would be happy to talk to you about what getting baptized means. Um, I think that's gonna be it. So Jason, would you lead us into giving? <laughs> no I give it up for Josh. <laughs> First time doing the announcements. Didn't he do great? <laughs> so good. All right. Um, turn to your neighbor and say, you look great. <laughs> so good to have you here today. All right. So listen, um, if you have not been baptized, you should get baptized next week. You know, we debated a little bit about should we baptize people on Easter? Because, you know, people come in their Sunday best. But I'm like, yes, this is what it's all about. So let's do it. Um, baptism is really you saying, hey, I've accepted Jesus. And baptism represents I've gone under the water, which is the old me, the me that's marked by my sin, my distance from God, goes under the water and it dies there. And I come up out of the water and it represents the fact that I am a new creation, I'm a new person in Jesus. His resurrection is my resurrection. His new life is my life. So if you haven't done it, do it. Put the, put the QR code back up. We're not moving on until 10 people fill out that QR code. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't even have any way to track that. So, but anyway, if you're serious. And also, here's the thing next week. You don't have to have signed up in advance. You can just come and get baptized during service, live during the service. Josh, are you scanning the QR code just so we move on? No, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Good. All right, let me take a minute before we get into the word and let me encourage us around our giving this morning, our generosity. All right, we've got this incredible promise in Luke chapter six, verse 38. This is what Jesus said. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. And so he's saying, whatever you give, God will return to you. But he doesn't just return it the way that you gave it. He shakes it up, presses it down, and causes it to run over, and then pours it into your lap. And so as we give, you know, a lot of us, that's a faith step. Like we're giving out of faith to say, all right, God, I gotta trust you that you're gonna come through for me. And so that is a good place to be because God is faithful, amen? All right, so let's pray. You can scan the QR code. We're also gonna pass some containers through the aisles. You can give that way as well. Father, we honor you. Lord, we thank you that you're here. God, we trust you. God, I, I pray that everyone who gives today, this week, Lord, that they would see your faithfulness in ways that they can't deny. And God, we know that you are a faithful God. And we trust you in that. And so, Father, I pray that this morning you would speak to us in a way that transforms us. Holy Spirit, come like fire and fill our hearts with passion and love for you. And I pray that we would see you for who you are God, that we wouldn't be able to deny that you are real, that you are near, that you are perfect, that you are love. And God, by the time we leave today, I pray that we have a greater revelation of you, and a deeper conviction that you are the center of it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, 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 amen. All right, we can pass the giving containers. Um, it is Palm Sunday. Yes, and for those of you who are like, what is that? Um, so Jesus, 
had been doing ministry for three years at this point, and he had become pretty popular. I mean, everyone was talking about him, and they were talking about him because he was confronting the religious system, like that was part of it. He was really going head to head with the religious establishment to be like, you guys have it wrong. But one of the bigger reasons why everyone was talking about him was because he was doing miracles. I mean, the big miracle was really that he raised Lazarus from the dead, but that wasn't even the only resurrection. I mean, he was doing miracles, and so everyone was like, this man is from God, this man is like tearing things up, and the Jewish people were hoping that God would send a savior, and their expectation was that this savior would come and restore political independence to their nation. That was their expectation. And so Jesus doing all of these miracles and confronting the corrupt political system, he's got the people on his side. And they're like, he's the man, he's gonna do it. He was controversial, but he was famous. And so he's just done all of these miracles and Passover is a huge um, celebration on the Jewish calendar. People from all over the Jewish territories and even beyond would descend on the capital city of Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, massive holiday. The city of Jerusalem would be packed to the walls as they celebrated Passover. And Jesus, Jesus goes from Lazarus's house, where he's raised the guy from the dead, up to Jerusalem. And the crowds are like, oh my gosh, it's Passover, everyone's here, he's going to the city, they're like, it's time. Like, Jesus is gonna throw down. That's what they're expecting. And so as he makes his way up to the city of Jerusalem, the crowds just go nuts. And it says in John 12, the next day the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way up to the city, and so they took palm branches and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Why palm branches? Well, I mean, for one, it was practical. There's a lot of palm trees there. But palms represent something in the ancient world. They represent overcoming adversity because a palm tree is fruitful and thriving even in a desert. And so they would rip these palm branches down, which always represent victory and overcoming difficult situations, and so they're waving these branches as a way of saying, like, our Savior's here. And they shout this Hebrew word, Hosanna, which means save us, or you're the Savior. And so Jesus goes up, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel, meaning you deserve to be the King. You, you deserve to take over this whole thing. I mean, these were like words of treason, essentially, but the crowd is shouting it. And Jesus walks into Jerusalem to this incredible fanfare. But no one would expect that by the time Passover actually happened, Thursday night, Friday afternoon, that this Jesus who was being hailed by the masses as the Savior would be hanging on a Roman cross, crushed and crucified by the same political system that was crushing them. And a lot of people lost faith in him because of that. But that's what we're gonna talk about on Friday, Good Friday. By the way, you should come back to church on Friday night for Good Friday. Um, this is not a small service. This is like the, the room I hope will be packed and it will be one of the most powerful moments of the whole year as we remember the cross. Good Friday at seven o'clock this, this week. And um, so Jesus is hailed as a savior. But, but there's... there's a symbolism in what Jesus did on his way up to Jerusalem that I wanna talk about for a few minutes. See, Jerusalem was the center of life for the Jewish people. And Jesus makes his way into the city. And, and I don't wanna discount how powerful the message of that is because it represents the very mission of Jesus from the beginning, which is that Jesus, you know, like, God didn't have to come be with us. Like, God's up in heaven. He sees all the brokenness on earth. He could have handled our issues any way he wanted to, right? I mean, he could have, like, rained down hail, fire, and brimstone and killed us all if he wanted to. He's in heaven. He could do whatever he wanted to. But, but yet, but yet that wasn't the intent of the Father. It wasn't the intent of the Father to look at us from a distance 
and to like send us a message saying, here's how you fix your problems, or I'm gonna kill you for being stupid, or you know, I'm gonna send you a little love note, hopefully you get it, or I'm gonna send you some rules, see how good you do, and then we'll talk. It wasn't the intent of the Father to interact with broken humanity that way. It was the intent of the Father to come right to the center of our lives and to physically be present with us there. See, all the way from the beginning of the scriptures, you see that it was God's intent to dwell with humanity, to be with humanity. And Jesus coming into the city, it wasn't just like a, um, it wasn't like this mysterious, yeah, God's sort of around here somewhere. It was a physical manifestation of God himself taking up residence at the center of where people do life. And see, that's always been God's intent. It was always God's intent to allow us to experience his manifest presence. So the presence of God is interesting because, you know, we believe in a, a big God, a God who created all of the world and all of the heavens and everything that we know. And we believe that one of the dynamics or attributes of God is that he is omnipresent, which means that God can be anywhere he wants to be, anytime, he's everywhere, he's all around, like he's always there. But yet, even though we know that there is an omnipresence to God, there are also these times where God would show up in physical form, where he would manifest his physical nature to be with us. We see that in the Garden of Eden, we see that in the Tabernacle of David, we see it with Moses in Mount Sinai. We see it in the Old Testament temple sacrificial system. And then Jesus is like the ultimate display of that where he physically comes. And then after that, we see the Holy Spirit coming on the day of Pentecost to actually be with us. And it is God himself manifesting his presence to be where we are. And again, God doesn't have to do this. But why would God do that? Because he wants to be with us. Because from the very outset of creating us, his biggest desire was that we would know his love and his love would be known by us. He, he, he wanted to manifest himself to be with us. And here's the thing, church. He still does that today. He shows up. Like he actually physically, experientially shows up. It's, it's not a philosophical idea of like, yeah, God is sort of mystical and around somewhere. Although that is, there's, there's a truth in that for sure. But it's more than that too. Like God actually wants to show up where we are in the middle of what we're doing, interrupting the business marketplace of Jerusalem, interrupting our trip to school, like Jesus I'm sure did on his way up to Jerusalem for some families, interrupting our everyday life where he actually interrupts what we're doing and shows up himself. And he's like, hey, I'm here. And so Jesus, he enters the city of Jerusalem and the city goes wild. And they don't really understand him and they don't really know what he's doing. And, you know, it causes all of these controversies and problems, which ultimately leads to the cross, which we'll talk about on Friday. But the night before he goes to the cross, he has dinner with his disciples. And John, who was Jesus' closest friend, writes down actually for a few chapters everything that Jesus said at that dinner. And then Jesus, after talking to them for a while, he starts praying. And he starts praying to the Father on behalf of his followers. And I wanna, I wanna read a few things that he prayed because it's so, it's so incredible what he was saying his desire for us was. In John 17, verse one, it says this. This is what Jesus prayed as he looked up into heaven. Father, the time has come. Unveil the glorious splendor of your son so that I will magnify your glory. That's a mistake. We're skipping back to the palm branch bit, which is not right. Sorry. <laughs> um, he says, unveil the glorious splendor of your son so that I will magnify your glory. Here, you can take that down. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, it's time, God. I want you to show them who I really am. I want you to show them what I'm really like. I want them to see 
the power, the love, the glory of who I am. And then in verse three, go ahead and go up to verse three. He goes on and he says, eternal life means to know and experience you as the only true God and to know and experience Jesus as the son whom you sent. So Jesus is saying, and he's praying this, but he's saying it you know, to the benefit of the disciples who were listening. He's saying, eternal life, real life, lasting life, fulfilled life is knowing you. And the only way that they can know you is to know me because Jesus paid the price for us to know the Father. And so he's saying the whole point of life, the whole fulfillment of life, the whole thing that would satisfy us for eternity, it is you. Knowing you, that's life. And then he says, now I am returning to you, Father. So I pray that they will experience and enter in to my joyous delight in you so that it is fulfilled in them and overflows. So he's like, I'm coming back. A couple days and I won't be here anymore. I'm gonna be with you. And he's saying, but what I want so much for these guys, I want them to experience the same joyous delight that I have in you. I want them to know that the radical extravagant joy and power of being in love with you. I want them to know you. Then he goes on in verse 26. I'm skipping a few things here. I have revealed to them who you are and I will continue to make you even more real to them so that they may experience the same endless love that you have for me. For your love will now live in them, even as I live in them. He's like, they've seen who you are because they've been watching me. But now, with the cross, with the resurrection, they're gonna know who you really are. And I pray that they would experience this delight, this love, this life that comes from knowing you, experiencing you, entering in to your love, into relationship with you. Guys, do you, do you hear, do you, do you hear the, the passionate heartbeat of what Jesus wants for us? What the whole point of this was? I mean, don't get me wrong. We, we need to make a big deal about the fact that the cross forgives us of our sins. Like that is, that's huge, right? Like we are a sinful, broken mess and we need a savior, Come on, someone knows what I'm talking about. Can anyone else say amen to that? <laughs> amen. All the perfect people are like, I don't think I need one. <laughs> Thank you. Please open up your wings and fly around the room for us. See how awesome you are. <laughs> no, <laughs> like we need a savior, right? Like we need someone to rescue us from ourselves. We, we can't undermine the power of that. But, but when you look at what, Jesus is praying here. When you look at the intents of God, the whole way through the scriptures, the, the cross and forgiveness, it was a huge deal, but it was a means to an end. The, the end is that we would enter into the knowledge of the almighty God, the Father, who is the center of it all, who is perfect and pure love and light and joy and ecstasy and perfection and holiness, the point is that we would know him, but not just like a distant idea of a philosophical understanding of a higher power. No, no, if that's all we needed, he just needed to send us a letter. But he didn't do that. He physically showed up in the middle of our lives. Like he manifested himself to say, I'm here to interrupt your story to show you who I am. And when God does that, it rarely makes sense <laughs> because he's God. Just like it didn't make sense to the Jewish people, which is why on Sunday, they're shouting Hosanna, and on Friday, they're shouting crucify him. Same people. Because they didn't get it. It didn't make sense to them, right? 
And when God physically shows up to us, it doesn't always make sense, but that's why we need to understand what the intent of God actually is. He wants us to experience the reality of who he is. In fact, Jesus had words for the Pharisees in John 5. And, and these, these words are, are, man, they were harsh. The Pharisees were the religious guys. They were the pastors. They were the people who do what I do. And he didn't get along with them very well. And he looked at them one day and he's like, you all study the scripture so diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. But these are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, you want to relate to God on an intellectual level. And you are waiting for God to make sense to you. And you are waiting for God to explain himself to you. And you think that you have the corner on the market because you know more than the average person because you've spent more time reading the scriptures than the average person. He's saying you want to know God here. You want him to make sense to you. But the reality is God's literally standing in front of you and you won't receive him. Why? Why? Because I don't understand him. But I wanna tell you that the intent of God is to stand right in front of you and reveal himself to you. And oftentimes when that happens, it won't make sense. So what will your response be? Well, I relate to the people in Jerusalem because some days I'm like, Hosanna, this is awesome. Man, last Sunday night, the six o'clock service, we're like running around the room doing laps. It was wild. I'm like, this is amazing. You know, and then life happens. And it's so easy to go from Hosanna to what the heck, which is what they did. Hosanna, crucify him. Hosanna, give us Barabbas. Hosanna, let him hang on a tree. Hosanna, wait, the tomb is empty. What? What are we gonna do with that? Oh, that's next Sunday. Come back. <laughs> and they have this fickle response. And Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, guys, like I am right here. And you, you, you can't receive me because it doesn't make sense to you. See, God wants to show himself to you personally, like just you. He wants to show himself to you experientially, not just here, but that you actually have experienced him. And he wants to show himself to you transformationally. In other words, when he shows up, it's personal. Like he knows what Jason Howard needs to hear today. He knows what you need to hear today. And when he shows up, he will tell you what you need to hear. He'll do what you need. It's personal for him because he's a personal God who wants relationship. It is experientially, in other words, it's something that you actually can feel. But we can't bank too much on our feelings because feelings are fickle. But God wants to show up in a way where we can't deny that he was there. And transformationally, in other words, you can't be close to God without being changed. He does surgery in our hearts and surgery in our minds. And he has a way of lovingly and gracefully pressing right on our fears and saying, what? Get out of here. And restoring us to be who we were always made to be. Children of God who were made in his image. I was reading this week, um, a few stories, and they're old stories, about people who had an experiential encounter with God. And I was reading these stories, and, and they started to, um, man, make my heart burn. Because sometimes when you hear how God has shown up in other people's lives, it makes you hungry for him to show up in your life even more. And, and the first account that I wanna read to you is, is from a very famous preacher named Jonathan Edwards, who led a huge revival, mainly in New England, right around the time of the American Revolution. And it was called the Great Awakening, which really changed the very dynamics of the American colonies. People came to know Jesus in massive numbers. The churches were overflowing. It's a huge move of God. And Jonathan Edwards is famous. Some of his, some of his sermons are still quoted very often today. But he wrote down in his journal one day some of the things he had experienced in these revival meetings. 
when thousands of people were coming to accept Jesus in these little churches all across New England and then all of the American territories and then even into England itself. And he was writing this, and I just wanna read some of what he wrote. He said, I have been particularly acquainted with many persons who've been the subjects of the high and extraordinary transports of the present day. Okay, let me just say, He's writing in the 1700s. He sounds a lot smarter than how we write today, okay? But let me break it down. He's saying that there are these people in these revival meetings, there are these people who are experiencing God, and he uses the word transports to describe their encounter with God. In other words, they were like taken somewhere with God. And he says, but in the highest transports I have been acquainted with and where the affections of admiration, love, and joy so far as another could judge, have been raised to the highest pitch. In other words, wait, go back. These people are having this encounter with God and, 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 and these feelings of, of affection and th- these, these feelings of admiration, of joy, they are at the highest possible level. And then he says, have been raised to the highest pitch. The following things have been united. In fact, all of these stories have a few similar themes. A very frequent dwelling for some considered considerable time together. In other words, they're just like spending time with God. Like they're not coming to church, going in, going out, like doing the thing. They're like captivated by his manifest presence and they don't want to leave. In views of the glory of the divine perfections and Christ's excellencies, so that the soul has been, as it were, perfectly overwhelmed and swallowed up with light and love, a sweet solace and a rest and joy of soul altogether unspeakable. Sometimes for five or six hours together without interruption, extraordinary views of divine things and the religious affections were frequently attended with very great effect on the body. Persons, deprived of all ability to stand or to speak. By times, the soul has been so overcome with admiration and a kind of omnipotent joy as to cause the person unavoidably to leap with all their might with joy and mighty exaltation. My modern day interpretation of what Jonathan Edwards is talking about is people show up and they get crazy. (laughs) They they experience God, they, they see him in his excellence. They, they see divine things and they don't want to leave him. And then sometimes it's like they've lost their ability to speak. They've lost their ability to stand. And then sometimes they are running around the room like crazy. There's another very famous mathematician and philosopher named Blaise Pascal, who also lived many, many years ago. And and he wrote this. He said, in the year of grace, 1654, on Monday, the 23rd of November, from about half past 10 in the evening until about half past 12, fire. And when you see how he wrote it in his journal, he just wrote the word fire, taking up a whole line. He said, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of the philosophers and scholars. Certitude, certitude, feeling, joy, peace. God of Jesus Christ. And then some Latin words, which if I try to pronounce, I will embarrass myself. Which mean, my God and your God. Joy, 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 tears of joy. Let me never be separated from him. We keep hold of him only by the ways taught in the gospel. Renunciation, total and sweet. In other words, giving my entire self over to him. Totally, and it is so sweet. Total submission to Jesus Christ. Eternally in joy for a day's training on earth. God showed up. There's another man who was a missionary to the Native Americans in the colonial period. 
And it was him who wrote this. He said, I was in a mournful and melancholy state and I was trying to pray. Can we just stop right there? Who can relate to that? <laughs> I don't use the words mournful and melancholy. We normally use words like depressed, anxious, tired, overwhelmed. He's a missionary doing great things for God and he felt ways too. Mournful and melancholy and I'm trying to pray and it's not working out too good. <laughs> I found no heart to engage in that or any other duty. As I was walking in a dark, thick grove, unspeakable glory seemed to open to the view and apprehensions of my soul. I do not mean any external brightness, for I saw no such thing, nor do I intend any imagination of a body of light, but it was a new inward apprehension or view that I had of God such as I never had before, nor anything which had the least resemblance of it. I stood still, I wondered, I admired. I knew that I never had seen before anything comparable to it for excellency and beauty. It was widely different from all the conceptions that I ever had of God or of things divine. My soul rejoiced with joy unspeakable to see such a glorious divine being. And I was inwardly pleased and satisfied. In other words, I didn't feel like garbage anymore. That he should be God over all forever and ever. My soul was so captivated and delighted with the excellency, loveliness, greatness, and other perfections of God that I was even swallowed up in him. God wants to show up. He wants to make himself real to us. He, he doesn't want to occupy only the intellect, although there is more to understand about God than we could possibly fathom. And that's a worthy pursuit to understand what he says and what he does. But he doesn't want to just stay there. He wants to manifest himself to us in a way that utterly transforms us. God not only wants us to be his children, he wants us to experience the reality of relationship with him, a relational knowing based on living together. He wants us to know him. Now, I read stories like that and I know that we can have, you know, a couple different responses. Some people read stories like that and you immediately have this shame narrative in your head. And you're like, oh, that's for like the super holy people. I'll never qualify to have an encounter with God like that. And I wanna tell you, that's the enemy talking you out of what God wants to give you. If you could earn your way to God's love, the cross was unnecessary. You can't earn your way there, so you shouldn't think that you can disqualify yourself from going there either. There is an invitation that God is offering for you to come and encounter him and know him. So shut down the voice of shame. But I also can't guarantee how God's gonna show up in your life because he knows better than I do what you need. But what I do know is that I can stay hungry for him. I can pursue him. I can desire him. And I can come with my time and my attention and my affection and honor him and make room for him to do what he wants to do in my life. So this is why Paul, when he's writing in the New Testament about how we live this Christian life, he says in a few different places, he says we walk with the Spirit. For those of you who are like, what's that mean? He's talking about the Holy Spirit who is God in us, around us, with us. He's like, we walk with God. We walk with him. And then he says, we are led by the Spirit. And then he says, we are filled with the Spirit. And so he's saying in this life, our life is now characterized by walking with him, by being led by him, by being filled with him. And what's interesting about all of those verbs is that in the Greek, they are a present and continual tense. We don't really have that so much in English, the way it exists in Greek. 
which means that what Paul is saying is walk with the Spirit and keep walking with Him and walk with Him more every day. Be led by the Spirit and keep being led by Him and be led by Him more every day. Be filled with the Spirit and keep being filled by Him every day. It's continual. And really what he's saying is, I want you to learn how to live life in a way where your posture to God is, I want more. I want more of you, Lord. I, I, I want more of who you are. I, I, I've felt your love. I've known your love. I've known your truth. I want more of it today than I had before. Guys, I will never forget when I was in high school and I was at a church service at the church I grew up at and the church is singing songs and everyone's worshiping. And I had been in a service like that like twice a week my whole life probably. And it's some Wednesday night. I was there for youth group and the church is worshiping. And I'll never forget that something changed in me one of those nights where I was on my knees and I felt God show up and I felt him ask me, will you give everything for me? And it was like, in light of, of this love that I feel right now, in light of the way that you are allowing yourself to be manifestly present to me right now, how can I say anything other than, yeah, you've got all of me forever. And I don't know why God showed up that day differently than he had shown up the week before, but he showed up and he changed me. And I think that what Paul is saying when he's saying, be filled and keep being filled, be led and keep being led, walk with and keep walking with is he's saying, there's more. <laughs> and the truth is, is that on that Wednesday night, I encountered God. But I don't want that to have been the highlight of my life. Because if he showed up for me as a 17-year-old, he'll show up for me even more as a 42-year-old. There's more. There's still more. He is still making his way into the center of the city of my life. He is still interrupting my trip to school to drop the kids off. He's still there, still saying, I wanna show up for you. See, God wants to give you a fundamental revelation and impartation of the Father's heart. He wants to reveal himself to you in a way so that you know what the Father is like. But you don't just know it like intellectually, like you know it because it's been revealed to you. It's been imparted to you. God also wants to operate on you, on your heart, on your mind, and on your will. And he'll pull you into moments with him where he'll reveal his heart to you. But in those moments of him pulling you into himself, he'll change you. And this is a lot of the reason why we don't experience God the way that we can. It's because we resist his transformational fingers. We, we don't really want him to start messing with us. But if you're really gonna let God show up, you've gotta give him permission to do what he wants to do in you. And he'll mess some, some stuff up. But you'll be a lot better on the other side. <laughs> always for good. And God wants to draw you out to a place with him from which you can never go back. Paul, Saul, his name was Saul. He, he was killing Christians. He was a bad guy. And he's riding his, I think it was, was it a donkey or a horse? I don't remember. He's riding up on the road towards the city of Damascus. And all of a sudden, was it a horse? Yeah, Jesus shows up, like just shows up. And when Jesus shows up, you know what happens to Paul? He gets knocked off the horse. He goes blind from the light. This is like a violent interruption. <laughs> but in that moment, Saul, who was resisting God at every turn, immediately let all of his defenses go down and say, Lord, what do you want from me? And Jesus is like, oh, I got big plans for you. It's gonna mess everything up. It's gonna be so good. And Paul's like, oh, and then he says, oh, also you're not Saul anymore, you're Paul. I'm just gonna change your name right now. And Paul's like, okay, whatever you wanna do. <laughs> so like, if you come in here, walk in, in here next week with a different name, we'll be like, okay, we get it, you know? <laughs> what do you want? You can have it all. You can have it all, you can have it all. See, 
Jesus took Saul to a place in him from where he could never go back. That's what I want. I wanna go to places with God from where I can never return. Was worship team. My friend has a ranch in Montana and I've gone out there a few times. And the first time I went out there, um, one of the nights I was there, there were absolutely no clouds in the sky and it's pretty remote. So there's no light coming from any buildings or anything. And I looked up at the sky and I saw something I'd never seen before. And it was like, Billions of stars. You could see bands of the Milky Way galaxy. It's the most beautiful thing. And then I saw this shooting star go the whole way across the sky. And it's like I had seen something that I knew was there, but I didn't know how much it was there. I, I've seen stars in Pittsburgh before. We have a few. <laughs> when it's not cloudy, which is three or four days a year. Like I've seen stars before. But in Montana, I saw the stars. And I can appreciate the stars over my house on a cloudless night. But I've seen more. And I know there is more. And it doesn't compare. And God wants to take you to a place in him where you see more of who he is and you can't go back to what you used to know because you've seen too much. Close your eyes for a second. South, this is for you too, close your eyes. I just want you to say to God, I want more. Reveal your glory to me. Reveal yourself to me. I want more. Holy Spirit, come and have your way. Holy Spirit, come and speak to us. Jesus, glorify yourself. Show us who you are. We want more. We want more. I'm gonna send it back to the team at South. Love you guys. If you're here today, um, keep your eyes closed. If you're here today and you don't know that you've ever personally had a real relationship with God, I wanna give you the opportunity right now to invite God in. For God so loved you that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You gotta let him in. He wants to come and forgive you and introduce you to a relationship with the Father. But you gotta give him permission. He's a loving God. He's not gonna force it on you. So with our eyes closed, if you're here and you're like, I, I, I want a relationship with him. I wanna know him. I'm gonna give you the opportunity to make that decision right now. And if you wanna receive a relationship with him, I'm gonna count to three and on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to slip up your hand, but we're not gonna embarrass you or call you out or anything like that. We're, we're just all together, we're gonna pray together. But the reason why I'm gonna ask you to do that, and I know it's kind of bold and a little uncomfortable, is because it's important for you to leave today knowing that this was the moment that you said yes to him. This was the moment where you asked for his grace to change you. And this does change. So with our eyes closed, if you, if you need to make this decision for the first time today, on the count of three, would you just slip up your hand and then we'll pray together. Man, he loves you so much. <laughs> You're his kid. He's dreamt about this moment since before you were born. He longs for you. He shed his blood for you. 
when he hung on the cross, he was thinking about you because he wanted you to know the love of the Father. So come on, why don't you take him up on his offer? One, two, three. Yeah. How awesome. How awesome. Now we're gonna pray together. If you had your hand raised, just repeat after me, but we're a big family, so we're gonna do it together. Say, Jesus. I say, yes. I want you. I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. And I wanna know you. Come and make your love known to me. I give you permission to save me and to bring me to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> amen. Yeah. If you raise your hand, two things I wanna tell you. First, stop by the welcome desk. We'd love to put a Bible in your hands. It's our gift to you. And second, keep coming back. <laughs> Can we stand to our feet? If you, if you need some prayer today, if you need someone to pray with you, our ministry team's gonna come down here to the front. If you just want an encounter with God or if you want a touch from God or if you have something in your life where you really need someone to just agree with you in prayer about, Come on down and our team will pray for you. But let's stay and let's just sing a song to God. And in this moment, let's just give him a couple more minutes to say, God, would you come and would you speak? Would you reveal your love to me? Would you reveal who you are to me? Come on, let's worship for a minute. Praises rise from the inside. From the inside of me, may you delight from the inside, from the inside of me. Let praises rise from the inside, from the inside.
God, we just say yes to you, to your love, to everything you are, everything you have, God. And Lord, I just bless everyone here, everyone watching online, with a greater knowledge, a greater awareness, a greater experience of you, God. Show us your glory, Lord. Show us your glory, Lord. The Lord is blessing you. The Lord is keeping you. The Lord is turning his face towards you. The Lord is smiling at you. And the Lord is giving you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We love you so much. Um, Friday night at seven o'clock for Good Friday. Um, it's gonna be powerful communion service. Next Sunday, Easter, nine and 11. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. And um, if you haven't signed up to serve, but you'd be willing to help out next Sunday, we'd appreciate that. If you go to the website, click the serve button or grab someone who um, can help you here at the welcome desk or one of the other team members, okay? Are you guys gonna keep singing? You starting another song? That's what you're doing? Okay, you can go. We love you so much. Have a phenomenal week. And we may or may not keep singing. <laughs>
Sanctuary, have a blessed week.